This is Rube Markward. Rube is a member of the Baseball Hall of Fame. He was born in Cleveland in 1889. He arrived in the big leagues 18 years later when the Giants bought him from Indianapolis for the then unheard of price of $11,000. He was in the major leagues for 18 years, from 1908 to 1925, mostly with the Giants and the Dodgers. And his main claim to fame is that he won 19 straight games in 1912, still a major league record. We were in his home in Pikesville, Maryland. Rube lived in a very, very nice apartment house. He was quite well off, married for the third time. His first wife had been Blossom Seeley, the, the stage star. And when I first called Rube up and asked him, uh, could I, first I wrote everybody a letter and told them what I was doing. And then I called them up and asked to set a time to talk to them. And when I called Rube up, he said to me, he said, well, you're writing a book, are you? And I said, yes. And he said, well, who's going to get the royalties? And I, and I started stammering and stuttering because I didn't have any publisher and I didn't have any idea who, that, that there'd even really be a book. And then from the other end of the room, I could hear Mrs. Markwood say, Rube, stop that. And he said, oh, oh, okay. He said, okay, come on over. When I was a youngster, all I wanted to do is play ball. And my father was against playing baseball. He was the chief engineer of the city of Cleveland. And I would go out and play with the kids, play ball, pitch and everything like that. And come home at night and he'd say, where were you? I was playing ball and he says, now listen, if you have it in your mind that you want to become a professional ball player, get that out. Because I want you to grow up and get an education and go to college. And when you have an education, you can go out and get a job. And if you haven't got an education, you're no good. And a ball player will never be any good. When I grew up, I said, I'm going to be a professional, and I said, you're going to be proud of me. He said, I'll never be proud of you if you're... How old were you then? Well, I was only about 12 years old. I wanted to be a ball player. I had a couple of balls in my pocket, you know, and I used to go out and see the big kids play and things like that. When I got to be about 14 or 15, I was tall for my age, and I used to pitch for them and friends of mine played with a team called Waterloo, Iowa. They were in the Iowa State League. I used to pitch for their team when they would barnstorm. He says, now, if you want to go to the town that we're playing in, Waterloo, we'll recommend you to uh, the manager. You were only about 16 or 17? I was 16 then. So they said, we'll recommend you to Charlie Frisbee. He's the manager. Well, in the spring of the year, I got a wire from Frisbee. And he said to me, he says, you've been highly recommended, and if you come to Waterloo and make good, we'll reimburse you and give you a contract. This was about 1905. Yes. From Cleveland, Ohio, I bummed my way to Waterloo, Iowa, freight trains and everything. I got off the railroad station, and the station master, he says, what are you doing here? Come on, get out of here. And I says, no, I says, I'm reporting to the Waterloo Ball Club. And he looked at me, he says, did you ever wash your face? I said, no. I says, I've been riding for five days and five nights. I says, I'm anxious to get here. I says, where do the ball players hang around? And he said, the smoke shop down the street about a half a mile. So I went down there and I got into place there and Frisbee happened to come in and I was introduced to him. He says, Keokuk is here tomorrow and we'll pitch you, I said. You don't want me to pitch tomorrow, I said, after what I've gone through. He says, tomorrow or never. I said, all right. Could I have $5 so I can get a clean shirt or something? He says, after the ball game tomorrow. Oh, boy. So the next day, Kia Cock team was there, and I warmed up. And, oh, I felt terrible. But I had it in my mind that I'm going to show them that I could make good. I went out and I pitched, and I beat them 6-1. to one. And that night, I thought, sure, by winning a ball game, I could get $10 advance on my salary. So I asked Mr. Frisbee, I said, I showed you that I could deliver the goods. Oh, he says, Kia Cucks in last place. He says, Whale Oskaloosa comes here. They're in second place. They're a tough team. And if he can beat them, then we'll talk. I said, all right. So I didn't say anything to any of them. That night, went down to the railroad station. The same baggage man was there, and he says, what are you doing down here? Well, I said, I'm going back to Cleveland, Ohio. 
He says, aren't you the kid that pitched today? I says, yes. And he said, why are you going home? Well, I'm so-and-so. He says, you're the best pitcher they've got on the ball club. So he says, now this train comes in at one o'clock and the engine unhooks. In the meantime, I'll talk to the baggage man. When the engine is hooked up, you'll get in back of there, and when it pulls out, he'll open the baggage door and he'll let you in. So that all happened, and when we were five miles out of town, he opened the door and then let me in. And So he said, I'll tell you, when we get to Chicago, when we get into the yards, this train slows up so that you're able to get off. But don't hesitate. When you get off that train, you beat it out of the yard because if you don't, there's so many detectives, they'll just grab you and throw you in jail. So I did. When we got to the yards, I got out of there and I got on the street. And about a block from where I got off, there was a fire engine house. And they were all to the fire. It was empty. And they had a big bellied iron stove. And it was warm, and I just sat in there for a little while. I went to sleep. And the fire department came back, and they shook me and did everything to get me. He said, Bum, you'll get out of here and do this. And I said, I'm no bum, I'm a ball player. You a ball player, where'd you ever play? And I told them, Cleveland around the sandlot. Oh, and they started kidding me about a ball player and everything. They said, where are you going? I said, back to Cleveland. You got any money? I said, no. So they got a little pool up of 4 or $5, and he says, on your way stop and get something to eat. I told him before I left, I says, now when I come back in the big league, I'm coming out to visit you. And my dad never knew that I bummed my way. He said, you mean to tell me that you were out playing professional ball? I says, no, the amateur ball. Did you get any money? I says, no, but got my expenses and things like that. In 1908, I went to Indianapolis. And when I was ready to leave, my dad says, now listen, I told you when you were a kid, 12 years old, 13, 14, and I kept preaching to you that I don't want to see you become a professional ball player, but you've got your mind made up that you're going to be one. Now I'm going to tell you, when you cross that threshold to go out and become a professional ball player, don't come back. I said, you don't mean that. He said, yes, I do. I said, well, I'm going, and you're going to be proud of me. So my grandfather, my father's father, he liked baseball and everything, and he, he told my dad, he says, now listen, when you were a youngster, I wanted you to be something. I wanted you to be a stone cutter, same as I did when I came here from the old country. He says, no, but you wanted to be an engineer. So you became an engineer. Richard's going to be a ball player, and he's going to be a great ball player. He's so determined that nothing is going to stop him. I had a strong willpower in my mind that I could beat anybody that I pitched against. So my first year with Indianapolis in 1908, I broke all world's records. I pitched 48 full games, won 28 of them, had the strikeout records and the least hits and everything like that. And they put me up on the block. And all the big league clubs bidding on me, like a horse being auctioned off. And I went to the New York Giants. 11000 The highest price that ever was paid for a ball player. $11,000. And when the team got to Chicago, I went out to that firehouse. And the only one was there that was when I first got there was the lieutenant. I walked up to him and I said, Lieutenant, do you remember me? Never saw you before in my life. He said, I don't know who you are. Well, I said, remember a couple of years ago, you caught me sleeping back at that stove there. Oh, he says, you the fellow that's the ball player? I says, yeah, remember I said, my name was Mark Ward, Richard Mark Ward. He says, yes, what are you doing here? Well, I said, I'm in the big league. I told you when I get in the big league, I was coming out. He says, who are you with? I says, I'm with the New York Giants. And boy, <laughs> That when the Giants had come to Chicago, he'd have every, all the kids in the neighborhood, everybody around there. And I'd come out there and sit in front there and talk to him and things like that. Every trip we got to Chicago, I'd go out and see him. Is that right? Yeah, or, uh, I'll tell you, it was really wonderful. So I never saw my dad until, oh, about 15 years. It, Didn't your father try to get in touch with you all this time? No, no, he, he, he was stubborn, so was I. So one day, the bat boy came in, he says, Ruby, he says, there's an elderly man outside, 
and he wants to see you. He says, is your father from Cleveland? I said, my father wouldn't go across the street to see me, but you go out and get his autograph book and bring it in, and I'll autograph it for him. So instead of bringing the book, he brought in my dad, <laughs> and we were both glad to see one another. I said, why didn't you tell me you were going to be out to the ball game? He said, I was afraid to make you nervous. I said, there were 35,000 people there. They didn't make me nervous. Well, I kept him there for two weeks, and he had a grand time, and he went home. The photographers and the newspaper men wanted to know the address of my dad in Cleveland, and I told them. So they went to Cleveland, got his picture and everything, and they asked him a lot of questions. And they said, did you ever play ball when you were a youngster? Oh, he says, I used to play ball, but I never became famous like Richard. Well, are you proud of me? He says, why shouldn't I be? Uh, he's a great ball player. <laughs> Friends of my dad, when they see him sitting on the porch, they'd say, well, Fred, you see what your son Rube did today? He said, who are you talking about, Rube? He said, your son Richard. He said, I told him baseball was no good. He even changed his name. <laughs> when I got to New York, McGraw said to me, when I reported the polo grounds, he said, now listen, he said, all the newspapermen, everybody in New York has got their eyes on you. Paying $11,000 for a man, they think he can't lose a ball game. Cincinnati's coming here Saturday. I want you to do some running, shagging the outfield, and you're pitching Saturday. I said, I think I can beat him too, because I had in my mind I could beat anybody. So Saturday came, and they had about 50,000 people there. I never saw such a crowd in my life. The umpires came out and the battery was announced. Bresnahan and Mark were for the Giants. The whole 50,000 just let out a roar, you know, applaud and everything. And believe it or not, I couldn't see Bresnahan. I was so nervous, shaking. So I threw my five balls to warm up and Miller Huggins was the first batter up, a little short fella. And the first ball I pitched, I hit him. Boom, right in the side. So the next man up, I walked, and the next man up, I walked. Three men on base and nobody out. So Hannes Lobert, you've heard of him, he was up there. And I let up on the first ball. Remember the car barns? Well, that's where he hit it, up in the car barns, the elevator track for a home run. And I walked to the bench, and McGraw looked at me. He said, what was the matter with you, Rube? I says, nothing at all, and no alibi. I said, I was just scared to death. 50,000 people, I says, I've been accustomed to seeing seven, 8,000 on 4th of July or doubleheader or thing like that. So finally he says, pay no attention to that. You go down to the clubhouse, change your clothes, and wait after the game. Did you like Mr. McGraw? Finest and the grandest man in the world to work for. That's not so. He loved his players. He, the players loved him. He was wonderful. You know, he was a, a little fighter. They called him Muggsy. And that was the only thing he despised. Anybody called him Muggsy. He didn't care who it was, he'd take a pop at him. And he couldn't make a step. <laughs> but outside of that, he was really a grand man. He took more baseball ability to the grave than any of these managers will know. Who was your roommate most of the Matty time? Matty on the road. He was just a great grand fella. He was a wonderful fella. He was a great checker player. We would go to Chicago, a place called White City, and you've seen this fellow with probably 15, 20 checkerboards. And when they see Matty come, they put their shell in the seat. They said, sorry, Matty, all filled up tonight. <laughs> he could tie him in the knot, and he loved to gamble. If you had a dollar in your pocket, he would, never would be satisfied until he got that dollar from you. He'd play poker, he'd shoot crap, anything at all. They always carried a thousand dollars with them. And you could win that thousand dollars if you were lucky with that one dollar. And Sundays he would never come out to a ballpark. He uh, would stand downstairs in the lobby of the hotel, wait for the ball players after they get through breakfast and time to go out to the ballpark. <laughs> He'd have a paradise in one hand and a deck of cards in his pocket. He said, let's go up for a little while. I've seen him lose seven, eight hundred dollars in one night. Never whimper a thing. Next huh. day, have fresh money. Do you think that they were tougher men in the sense of if they were hurt, they wouldn't drop out of the game? We were playing Pittsburgh, and Hunter Wagner was playing. He slid into second base, 
and he, as he did, he slid along about two feet, and that staple cut it right through his sliding pants, that deep, from his knee up to here. That's how deep that was. Players got all around him, and he lowered his pants, and everybody that was chewing tobacco took the chew out and put it in, patted it, and pulled up his pants and finished the ball game. And we had a doctor, and he put in 26 stitches from here to there. Four days later, he was dead.